psychological physician and basically deal with sort of people with their problems and the three common things that we deal with are hearing loss, tinnitus and dizziness. And um, for my NHS work I am based at the Nurse Throat Hospital at the um, Royal National Throat site and um, on certain days of the week I see my private clients at Hall Estate. Most patients with tinnitus have some degree of associated hearing loss. So the barest minimum that we think of in terms of testing is a standard hearing test and immediately a pressure test before we sort of decide anything in terms of sophisticated investigation such as brain scan. Uh, my personal feeling is things are now beginning to sort of gradually change with sort of the increasing awareness and access to sort of information on the internet. I think more and more GPs are sort of quite willing to sort of refer patients and I think that trend is changing now. And um, again what is important is like sort of tinnitus in the majority of individuals is not a um, concern like it is generally tend to be non-intrusive. It's only a small proportion of patients where it is really intrusive and sort of to certain extent sort of start to affect their day-to-day -day living. And GPs are quite mindful of these things and I think in my personal experience they are being appropriately referred these days. And if any there has been an increase in number of these referrals in the past to sort of at least a few months if not years. I would say approximately about 30% of my clients would have tinnitus and uh, as I said earlier with increasing awareness and uh, people being able to sort of uh, even contact you directly through emails, uh, I think there has been an increase in the number of people sort of asking for help or sort of approaching you for further, further management strategies. Both probably and uh, because of increased awareness people know where to go and who to contact and the other thing is like sort of we are um, living in an increasingly noisy world and sort of a lot of us um, have had exposure to sort of uh, loud music and um, music gigs particularly among staying stairs so that may be sort of another reason why sort of uh, we are seeing more people. Just of a model is a good working model. It tries to sort of explain tinnitus in a very sort of uh, practical way based on sort of um, electrical rhythm because when it comes to sound perception what the brain does is pattern recognition. It recognizes pattern for electrical activity in the auditory system and gives meaning to it. And what is thought to happen in people with tinnitus is there is a sort of a, an alteration in the electrical pattern and the brain sort of misinterprets some of the signals. So it gives you a working model in terms of uh, explaining things to the patients like sort of um, when you counsel individuals with tinnitus. So it is a good model. And how much I do sort of tinnitus retraining therapy as proposed by Jastafop, probably I don't sort of subscribe, subscribe to the sort of whole package because it's quite prolonged and um, it's a sort of um, long-term treatment uh, in the majority of individuals as proposed by Jastafop. But what we do is we use the principles, but we use modifications to the technique. Habituation is um, adaptation by the central nervous system to these sort of changes in the electrical rhythm, particularly when these sort of changes happen in a very slow way. Whereas masking is a temporary phenomenon where you tend to suppress things. So adaptation in the long run gives you better results than sort of masking. But there are, having said that, there are people who find masking as a, a relief when it comes to sort of dealing with tinnitus. But these days we don't necessarily use masking. I particularly don't use masking to suppress tinnitus. We use it if white noise generators slightly at a lower level than the intensity of the tinnitus because that way it helps people habituate much better than masking it completely. Sometimes you know, there might be a danger sort of it might sort of make the tinnitus worse in people who are very sensitive to loud noises because if you try to mask sometimes you have to use really very loud sound intensity levels which is yeah. probably not 
a good idea. But anyhow, most of the white noise generators, the upper limit of sort of noise intensity is set, so there is less risk of you sort of over amplifying it. But the principle that we use these days is sound enrichment rather than masking, trying to mask the tinnitus. Hyperacusis is uh, discomfort to unamplified noise that hasn't been sort of uncomfortable in the past in an individual and uh, it, ha it is not uncomfortable to others who don't have hyperacusis. So basically it's an abnormal sensitivity to certain noises to which you are not sort of uh, uncomfortable in the past. And um, it is not an uncommon problem, about 40% according to some studies of individuals with tinnitus have concomitant or associated hyperacusis. And the principles of management is more or less like tinnitus retraining with or without some medical or drug treatment. And the drugs that we commonly sort of employ is antidepressant group of drugs. And, but again, universally, not every person benefits by the use of drugs. And there are sort of people who find taking antidepressants as part of the tinnitus retraining helpful in managing their hyperacusis. There are certain audiological tests that we can do. There's a particular thing called the loudness discomfort levels. So you can sort of test the individuals for how sensitive that they are to certain noises and you can get an idea about like what sort of levels would make them uncomfortable. And then that gives you sort of a baseline for you to sort of work on these individuals in terms of uh, retraining techniques and medical treatment as necessary. Tinnitus is an abnormal auditory perception due to sort of altered uh, rhythm based on the neurophysiological model in the auditory system and as a result of which people when they become sort of uh, abnormally aware of this noise like they tend to develop sort of other associated psychological issues depending on their sort of previous experience and their previous psychological status to a certain extent so my feeling is there is a sort of contribution like both psychological as well as neurophysiological so as I said earlier the truth is probably somewhere in the middle and I won't sort of uh, completely exclude one um, for the sake of the other. And most of people with tinnitus need counseling and some sort of cognitive behavioral sort of uh, techniques, particularly in a very small proportion of patients where your other methods of tinnitus retraining is not helpful. It is useful to have additional cognitive behavioral therapy which helps the individual to identify and demystify some of their false ideas or thoughts about tinnitus which helps them to sort of change their reaction to the tinnitus. The important thing to understand is um, that tinnitus is not an uncommon problem and in the majority of instances it's not associated with anything sinister because most of the time it's the fear of the unknown. Uh, people once they get tinnitus they start to think that there is something seriously wrong with their head or they are sort of um, uh, developing some serious medical condition. So it is important to understand in the majority of instances tinnitus is not associated with anything sinister. So that kind of sort of helps you to reassure and approach the sort of uh, the tinnitus issue in a much rational way. Thank you very much for uh, asking me to give this interview this morning.